We were planning a very boring talk for you earlier. I think you've seen many talks about the future of cities and what the future will be like, and there'll be smart, and there'll be computers, and there'll be all kinds of digital transformation. And so we were chatting a bit before we were getting started, and I thought, well, if all we talk about is the internet, then we won't talk about anything interesting. And so I thought maybe I'll share with you a few ideas from maybe my perspective, and we'll see what my colleagues have to say. I'll try to moderate our discussion. My name is Amal Sarva. I'm the founder of Notel. We're a business that runs offices, flexible offices. Uh, we have 25 buildings in New York, and we're opening London and San Francisco, and soon there'll be hundreds of them. Uh, and I've started many other companies. I started one of the largest mobile phone networks in the United States called Virgin Mobile USA, and a smartphone business called Peak, a neuroscience business. And so I'm a little bit new to the business of office and real estate, but I've been thinking a lot about how cities are changing and what my role is in them. And so I thought, first, I'll tell you exactly what is the future of cities. <laughs> this is the past of cities. This is 1666 in London, and Severio, before we got together, was telling me uh, usually they start planning cities after they burn. And the, the vision of the future of what a city might be like is a theme that's been for a very long time uh, always what people are searching for. And here you see an image from Rem Koolhaas, the famous architect, uh, a Dutch artist, um, rendered this for his book uh, about New York, and a book where he coined the concept of Manhattanism, of buildings having sex. And that is how New York was created. A city that wasn't very planned for much of its existence. This one's from Corbusier. Maybe you know this, the La Ville uh, Merveilleuse, the radiant city. Uh, it, it seems so, so perfect when you look at it like this, and I think the reality didn't turn out uh, quite so nicely. So that was my first idea about planning and about the dream of the future city. And here's my second idea. This is where the humans live in the world. Uh, you see they live in only a few places. And if you put them all together, if you made a city as dense as Paris, all the people would fit in that space. Or even a city that's not so dense, you'd fit in only that space. All the people. Super cities. But they have a problem, super cities. And maybe you saw this picture after the election we had in the United States. It didn't go very well. And part of how it did not go very well was 60% of the economic output. The cities voted against this guy who won, and the 40% put him in power. We'll see what the consequences are. Next idea is water. There will be more. This is a simple picture. Someone's playing around with what will New York look like. And this is an artist. This is a maybe more optimistic vision for what New York might look like 50 years in the future. But of course, you all saw this picture, again from Houston. And this was just two weeks ago. My last idea for you is about uh, transportation. So I was looking for some t-shirts to take home to my family, and apparently Vienna is the city of bicycles. You must be very proud. How many of you are from Vienna or within one hour of Vienna? Maybe you can raise your hand for me. Ah, so we're on home territory <laughs> for the citizens of this fine city. I took this poll that some scientists who study urbanization created, and uh, it shows you the square area devoted to each form of transportation. So you, Vienna, are 60% cars, 30% trains, 10% bicycles. Even higher than I read the chart. This is a city that we have been talking about for the last couple of minutes, Houston. Houston has a lot of parking. When cars are driving themselves and you don't own them, you won't need any parking. Houston today looks like this. The red squares are parking. The yellow squares are covered parking. And the green is the parks. 20% of Houston is parking. And I don't think Vienna is very different. So those are the big ideas. Those are five. And we'll see what my colleagues have to say. Because the question I want to put to them isn't the boring question of what's the future of cities. It's uh, what's the future of Vienna? What's your place in the future of cities? And so I thought maybe we start with this crazy thing. And Severio can talk to us about it. Sure. It's a crazy boat. Severio, tell us what you do. So you're with Carlo Rotti. Um, 
So as Carl Rath just chatted, we, we are very interested in the relation between the physical space and the digital technologies. So now, like the networks and mobile phones have changed the way we interact with cities. And uh, we do a lot, we cross a lot of scales of design, from product design to service design to master planning and architecture. And uh, we do a lot of crazy ideas and crazy projects. One of those was about uh, reinventing the mobility in Paris by allowing people to move their own boat by cycling and doing fitness. <laughs> They're actually driving the boat <laughs> yeah, with the cycle. Yes, exactly. So <laughs> like, those are artists, uh, technology and equipments. And this project was developed together with the Italian like, uh, fit uh, fitness equipment, uh, equipment manufacturing uh, company, uh, Technogy. And actually, you would like, you know, jump on a boat and start cycling and doing your own like, exercise, daily exercise, and the energy produced by you would serve to move the boat around like uh, the Seine in Paris. And uh, you would have these uh, interactive screens on, on, on the boat where you, would, you can monitor in real time your energy production, your speed, your activity, and so on. So, so for us, it was a way boat? to engage the city in a new relation with the river and also like, raise awareness on the, 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 the issue of you know, CO2 emission, the issue of like, um, uh, cards and so on, and raising awareness on personal production of energy, in a way. It's a stream of research that we have done in several other projects, like Copenhagen Wheel and so on. Ah, right, because I think some of the work that you guys have done, it touches on these concepts, but I wonder, who's, has someone built your boat? When will they launch this boat? We are like now in the process of scouting like for investors in internet to, to build the boat. So like technology is on our site and we are looking for partners in Paris actually to build ah, this boat. So fantastic. The leaders of VNR are here. <laughs> Maybe so the yeah. Danube needs this boat. This could be like and a it, cool it can, project. It can again. be done. Yeah, absolutely. But tell us more about water. I mean, part of what's cool about that image that we were just looking at is it's, uh, I mean, in a way, it's a city underwater and it's a design for that future with water. That boat could have been in Houston or in New York in 2050. Um, have you been conceptualizing some vision of the future with climate change when cities are simply flooded? We actually worked a lot, not really on future scenarios of flooded cities, but more how to prevent that. So we worked a lot on the mobility scenarios. Like, for example, like, uh, we developed this project in the, together with the MIT Sensible City Lab, this is called Copenhagen Wheel, that re-envisioned the um, the, the use of bikes by um, creating a back wheel that is able to uh, store energy and give you back, uh, so basically uh, uh, transforming a normal bike into an hybrid bike just by changing the back wheel. And that is like uh, um, uh, uh, commanded through like your mobile phone, through an app. And not only that, it has, it has also sensor to monitor the quality of air and the quality and the emergencies that are happening throughout your route to your work and then you can basically uh, change your route or modify your paths throughout the city according to real-time condition of the city. And uh, a lot of our work is also about sensing flows, sensing like uh, 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 things that are happening in the city. So and part of the way you do your work is deploying technology and new ideas, not necessarily building a building, but changing the urban infrastructure through these systems. Absolutely. Uh, we think that the city is not going to change in the future too much. You are still going to see a lot of windows a lot of pillars, a lot of labs. I mean, the physical constituents of the city probably will stay the same. What will change is the way this physical infrastructure will react with us and will react through uh, different means, which are mm. based on new technologies. And so we think this like, sort of uh, short circuit between an old structure of the city and new technologies can prove to be very productive and very uh, fruitful. So let me move on this topic of technology and, and bring it to Timo. Uh, he was telling me last night that SAP serves something like 45,000 municipalities around the world, and the game I was playing with him was to get him to name them. And I think he was able to name... <laughs> well, first, first of all, uh, Vienna. So uh, thank you, Vienna, for being customers. Yeah, so tell me about what's the vision for um, how technology and vision can uh, transform cities like Vienna, maybe the cities that were the brightest lights on that map I showed, and then maybe some of the cities that don't show up at all sure. on that map I showed. So first of all, just uh, out of interest, hands up if you knew that uh, Vienna was actually ranked the number one smart city in the world earlier this year by Rollenberger. 
Maria's not even raising no. her hand. She's, okay. uh, she's so with T-Mobile. That's, that's right? <laughs> uh, and Vienna did it by having a very broad-based approach based on uh, sustainability, IT, and, and so on, having a coherent plan. There were lots of cities that were better in particular areas, but Vienna did the best job overall in overall livability. So we help run cities, um, and we believe there's a massive opportunity to use the latest technologies to run them even better. Uh, sensors in particular allow previously invisible processes to be revealed and then optimized. So we work for the city of Karlsruhe, for example, where they're taking the street lamps and making them intelligent. So installing sensors for traffic and pollution, adding free Wi-Fi, adding electricity sockets for powering electric But Timo, cars. I feel like I hear this story or this vision or this pitch all the time about all these smart sensor, light, electric, internet, controlled, whatever. It's probably a good sign it's yet, real. I have yet to see, see it impact my life. Is it secretly impacting my life every second <laughs> and I don't know It's going to impact your life a lot more than that boat <laughs> <laughs> in, in Paris. Um, yes, so the traffic. You don't see the traffic being optimized mm. in Karlsruhe, but it's happening thanks to those sensors. Mm. Um, so by being able to detect in, ta in real time the traffic and then react to that in real time, you can train, change the traffic signals. The next generation is even more powerful in that you've got machine learning and algorithms that will detect the rhythms of your city and it will automatically start optimizing itself. Today, it's a very phys physical, manual process. Somebody in city government has to try and tweak every aspect of provisioning electricity or water or anything else mm. to your city. In time, if you have the sensors with real-time data, it can start doing that automatically for you, optimizing the traffic on the fly according to the latest circumstances. And it's doing it in Karlsburg. Karl Karlsruhe is one of the examples, yeah. but with many... so. Um, Buenos Aires, for example, the, uh, the traffic, the garbage trucks, like every other city in the world, they had a regular route that they would follow, regardless of how much garbage there was. Mm. What a crazy waste of resources. But you have a rhythm to where the garbage might be that's over seasons, or it might be a particular big event. Mm -hmm. So why not adapt the garbage picking to the real-time situation? Go and pick up the garbage only when there's garbage. So, they changed, they're able to change the So Barcelona did there something very similar. Mm. Uh, changed the use of the resources on the fly based on what's actually needed. So I guess you need uh, more sorry, connectivity. Light, yes. So, but lighting, for example, street lamps. Uh, why keep the street lamps on at full brightness if there's nobody around? Add sensors, turn them off when there's nobody around. As soon as somebody starts walking, turn it back on. That's easy to do with today's technology. What's different, what's hard, is just our way of dealing with change, especially in city environments. A lot of cities are just in silos and hard, find it hard to put in place that strategy. All right, so let's see. Uh, Maria was unaware that Roland Berger likes Vienna. <laughs> I'm not sure who paid, you know, the study, so... <laughs> but tell me about, I mean, so we're hearing a story from Timo that connectivity is hugely important in making the city smart and sensible and responsive to people and their needs and their patterns. And presumably, this is your business every day. You're building networks on garbage trucks? Uh, we do. We do that in Croatia. Uh, but uh, let me start. So you, uh, do you're we, asking... We've done so a lot of joint projects together, by the way. You see? Right. You see? Uh, uh, so, but let me start. Uh, do I see an advantage you know, for Vienna or for, for even smaller cities? Because I think uh, it's a question of how can we live in cities much more because, you know, everyone is going into cities, so currently 50% of population is living in a city, soon it will be 70%. And key question is how make we uh, the best out of the resources we have here. And, uh, for example, I have a little daughter, five years old, and I'm always in the traffic jam. So either I'm too late in the office or I'm too late in the kindergarten. So for me, it would be really helpful to have no traffic jams and to be, you know, uh, that the smart lightning or smart uh, traffic, jam, uh, traffic lights will help me. So I, see, I see, really see the advantage there. And from the examples we are having, it's much more in Eastern Europe than we see in Vienna. Why is that? Because uh, there are huge 
funds from the European Union towards, um, you know, Croatia, um, Romania, uh, and so on. And we see we really have difficulties to, to, to you know, to, to get forward in, in Austria. It's mm -hmm. quite difficult to finance uh, the smart cities, either in smart lighting or in uh, the smart traffic projects which just described. Yes, very. Just to add, I think the discussion is quite interesting because, like, um, there's all these smart technologies deployed, and you see you, you, you are quite blind to them, right, as a, as a citizen in a way. And you basically get the effects, but you don't know they are there. And, like, the control rooms of these systems are often, like, you know, closed in some back doors and back rooms, like, they don't know even the existence. And the discussion is really interesting because we are often like, we, we are a design office, so we, don't, we are not technology provider. We don't sell softwares, neither like, you know, provide connection or connectivity. And so for us, like, this system can become a canvas to do something else. For example, like smart poles and smart lighting, in a recent project, we are using it as a sort of um, infrastructure throughout the city to design your own Christmas decoration. So we are telling the city, why don't you do a contest? And why don't you let people reinvent the Christmas decoration by drawing their own, like, you know, art, art, uh, art piece using, like, smart uh, street lamps. So I think, like, uh, it's true, like, probably the, the effects are not that visible, but it's also the, 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 the task or the goal of our uh, creative world to bring those things visible and to make them... Uh, um, available for other users. So let me ask another question about something invisible, and this one is for you, Davide. I've been asking these guys about um, super cities and what advantages they might have using technology and what are the situation or the strategy of a smaller city or even of a non-city. And uh, you had an interesting answer to this question. I asked you um, what time in history would you like to have been born? And everybody laughed at me when I asked them this question. Obviously, when would you like to have been born? Today, of course, the best time in human history. But then I asked you the question, fine, then where in the world would you have wished to have been born? And tell me your answer. So, thanks. Uh, I think the, the real answer about, and it's also related to the topic before, it's uh, uh, Europe has an incredible opportunity. Uh, U.S. is for sure the center of the technology at the moment, and uh, all the main technology are developing there. Asia re is really pushing and is trying to, to, to go uh, and faster and to try to compete with U.S. But uh, uh, we are probably all over, from uh, all over Europe, and the interesting fact is that uh, the number of talents that we have around our cities and our country, it's really incredible. And when we talk about cities, it's really important that we talk about the technology that helps people to live better, but it's more important is how these people can live, how these people will work, how will these people will be trained to be the citizen of the future. And this is something that we are really working on to try to understand, because at the end, the one city is like 50% is when you sleep, and 50% is that you work there. Probably not 50-50, but 40-40. So uh, <laughs> at the end, it's pretty easy. So the idea is how we can try to help people to work better. And if we think about our solution, actually, is with small and hold very small offices. But the problem is what you are seeing is uh, it's totally different because people want to have a different type of work and the attitude... But Davide, tell us more about Talent Garden and maybe give us that perspective. Absolutely. So Talent Garden is a, a co-working space network and we start exactly with a, this idea to try to help people to work better, to be more productive because we are working every day uh, for, thanks to uh, technology. So we are on Skype, we are on WhatsApp and whatever, but at the end, the best ideas comes from uh, networking, the physical networking, drink a coffee together, eat something together. And we try, what we are trying to do every day is try to bring the best talents, we select it, uh, so it's not only a shared space that is important because people are not thinking anymore about how to manage their own space, but it's about the selection of the people that are inside this space. Hang on so, a second though, David. I mean, every company is choosing which people come into the company and trying to create a wonderful environment. I'm sure when Maria goes to the office, she has amazing and talented colleagues. Are you doing something so different? The idea is that we bring uh, different companies together. 
And uh, this is totally different because it's probably more easy to work with colleague. But when you bring different companies in the same space, you have to really work to try to create connection and try to work uh, and help them to create. Because the problem is that we have this uh, dream of the Google office in San Francisco or the Facebook offices. But why we cannot bring the same uh, creativity level, the same working attitude also in small startups or small uh, corporate that are growing? Uh, also because not everyone wants to work for a company, but there are uh, rising uh, all the freelance activity. And uh, where well, I was all with these people uh, will work? I was with an investor, a Viennese-based investor, earlier in the day today, and he was telling me that many of the young companies that they meet, first of all, they don't meet so many young companies, and when they do meet them, they have to navigate a very old-fashioned and very annoying traditional office market that, especially in places like the first district here, is impossible. They can't work anywhere. And uh, it seems to me obvious they just don't have co-working in Vienna. Is there co-working in Vienna? Of Does course. someone here run a co-working network? Of course. What's your analysis, Davide? Is there a... So there are some co-working in Vienna, absolutely, yes. Uh, our situation, I think that uh, Vienna, the perception at the moment of co-working is a, is a small vertical nickel that only few people can have it. The reality, seeing what is happening worldwide, is that the market is huge. Uh, we are also working to bring uh, Talent Garden to Vienna because we think that there is a big opportunity to try to bring the best talents of the city together and connect uh, at European level with the rest of our network. At the moment, we are in six different countries, in 20 different cities, and we think that the main challenge for European startups and freelancers are to be connected. Because when you are in the US, it's pretty easy to move from one state to the other. When you are around Europe, the difference, the cultural barrier, the, the, the bureaucratic barrier are really high. And having a common platform that can help you to get more connected in your city, but also around Europe, is the real main challenge that we have. I want to go to the next topic of self-driving automation and parking. We spoke a little bit about um, sensors in a smart city. But I want to chase this topic with you, Maria, a little bit. Okay, fine, they'll buy a SIM card from you and they'll put it in the car, great. And the car will drive itself. Maybe they won't own the car. Many of us in the US are sitting and thinking, wow, this is going to really change the labor market. It's going to change the structure of the commercial automotive market and where things are made and who are the champions and who makes money. But how will it change, uh, how will it change cities? How will it change Vienna? I mean, is this something that you guys have been thinking and planning for? Uh, maybe let me start where we are currently. So, um, unfortunately, Austria, overall is there is this 5G readiness index and we are rather in the bottom than in the top uh, so uh, that's an issue so connectivity and readiness for 5G readiness for autonomous driving is is key in order to have it then you know and um, oh, because it needs to work in the mountains too no no it <laughs> needs to work here you know in the countryside so ah. we go, you know if you just go outside of Vienna you're in a rural countryside so so ah. uh, and and the issue is that uh, our fixed line is rather a week so we really need to come up uh, and, and uh, you know also from a mobile infrastructure we really need to build up uh, infrastructure here so that's the first point in order to be ready for autonomous driving you mm -hmm. have to have a good infrastructure we are working uh, on that especially you know also to be ready for 5g so we are trying to be a front runner uh, in Europe uh, so let's fingers crossed in order to do that and I think then uh, we need to work together with munici municipalities, but also, as you said, with talented people, but also, you know, with a lot of mid-sized companies here in Austria. There was just uh, a new factory uh, presented last week. Uh, you know, it's a competitor of Tesla. So, uh, you know, working here in Austria, at, it's called Kreisel, it's really great. So we have a huge potential here. It's just that first we need the connectivity and then we need, you know, the partnering of these companies. And then I think we are ready to talk about the impacts of, uh, of the digitization. Yes. So this is here. the shopping list for the T-Mobile network. Th Why do you think it's a shopping list? <laughs> no, I, I really believe <laughs> Meaning it's the uh, if there is agenda. no connectivity, there will be no autonomous driving. <laughs> of course, of course. So then, Timo, let me bring the question to you, right? Uh, you're, let's see, you're the innovation evangelist for SAP. Yes. So bring us the word of God, then. Where, where, will, the, <laughs> where will the future take Vienna when the cars drive themselves? So the, the, the future of cities is up to us to decide. One aspect of that is absolutely... Um, reducing the number of cars. We'll be able to do that with new technology. I live in Paris. They're absolutely already planning for the post-car future. I personally haven't 
owned a car in 15 years and see no need to do so ever again. Um, pre-Uber, pre-Lyft, pre-everything. Yeah, I live in Paris. Uh, you walk. Public transport, I walk, cycle, great. Um, the, there are two types of things that affect our lives in city. One is things that nobody likes, everybody would like to avoid, flooding. Buenos Aires, they used to have flood every year, they put in sensors, we helped them detect in advance which parts of the drainage network were going to be blocked, they could clear it before the flooding, flooding actually happened. So predicting and preventing stuff that we don't want, bad traffic, pollution, we can absolute, absolutely use technology in new ways to do that. The next phase is deciding what we do want. That's much harder because each of us has a slightly defi different definition of livability. So we have to, as citizens, be able to work with the people that run our cities, not just the city councils, but the businesses and the associations that are a part of the city complex. The next opportunity is to increase the transparency and communication so that we can co-create the city of the future. Today, I'd say it's very early days. We, have, we work with a lot of city councils that are trying to increase their transparency. So the um, city of Boston has 2,000 KPIs of what they think means to be In my a business, good I city. Have five. Right. So but, but this is, cities have much more trade-offs. It's not about profit. Um, so, you know, how, how quickly potholes are fixed, how quickly somebody responds to a crime. So tracking that and showing people how they're doing is part of that transparency. We have places in Mexico that have put their entire budget online because so of... So can production. absorb, internalize, better connect to the facts, but also to citizen opinion using approaches yeah. like this. Now, I want to take the question to, to you, Severio. The question I was asking was, hey, what do we do when there's 20% more real estate? What would you do with it? Yeah. You guys are architects. What well, would you do? That's an interesting question. Like, for us, the driverless like, uh, paradigm has been already sort of material for design. And uh, the map that you see of Houston uh, with like, a lot of red dots will be empty red dots because basically those parking lots will be probably like, reduced to 30% of the actual needs in the next, you know, 20 years, 25 years, we, if the driverless like uh, scenario will go as predicted. And so we have recently uh, designed a tower in Singapore, like 280 meters tower with a huge plinth with eight floors of um, parking areas. And we designed those parking thinking about the future. So thinking how can we uh, reuse those parking as they will be empty in the next 20 years. And the, for this was a huge selling point towards the client because they were really happy to gain like, you know, square, square like meters uh, in the future for like uh, for co-working spaces or for, for gyms or for like uh, other activities that related to, to the main tower. So I think like thinking in advance of what are like the, 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 the outcomes of such scenarios on our building materials and infrastructure. Yeah, that's amazing is that quite you're important. concretely implementing the scenario for driverless already built in yep. Singapore. Yep. So let me bring the question out to Davide, the following question. We have a difficult political situation in the United States. You may or may not have been following. <laughs> Why? War is imminent. <laughs> Civil war is imminent. The president may not make it till the end of the year. It's not great. <laughs> it's not good for business. It's not good for society. We're all upset. And at least one of the things that led us to the situation we have was cities. Cities work amazingly. The line from, I guess, uh, Mies van der Rohe is that a house is a machine, or is it Corbusier, is a house is a machine for living in. And in fact, it's the cities that are the machines for living in. They've been growing massively, right? And so, Davide, you're bringing uh, a modern geo-culture to six countries across Europe and 20 cities, and you're, you're bringing progress, and aren't you also bringing some dangerous risks? Apparently, 20 minutes outside of Vienna are some angry guys with pitchforks who want to raid the raid the castle. I don't think what so. Is our, what is our <laughs> responsibility and our anxiety as we modernize these cities ever faster? What happens to the, the mountains no. and the farms? I think the, the real challenge that we will have for the next 20 years is about education. Because what we've seen in the United States come exactly from the problem of education and how the education has to change to try to involve not only few people that are working at the moment in the digital sector, but to bring this level of knowledge, this level of also prosperity 
to the, the normal people, the ones that are 20 minutes outside the cities. Uh, two years and a half ago, we start uh, to develop a program to educa for education to try to bring the best people that has a passion for innovation and tech, but to bring them and to transform that passion into a job. We try to use the format of bootcamp, that is something that also Obama really pushed in the last years around the United States, because it's a very short uh, method to, to make training. Normally, it's 12 weeks in which you try to train all the new workers in the tech sector, developers, designers, uh, marketing developers, because at the moment we see this profile only very high-level profile, but the problem is more and more in the next years, we'll be, the, the world will need this type of professional with uh, lower skills. Skills. And so our idea is that uh, people will change their work uh, out every 10 years, probably, in the future. So how can the education system uh, adapt to it? So it has to be very quick education, has to be really professional education, and for us, education is the only way to give an answer to this uh, big problem that politics is only a part of it, but the problem is uh, an occupancy rate, uh, economical development, yes. and so on. Yes. So at the beginning, we, start, we said that we'd give you some advice. I would ask these guys, how are we going to solve the problems that confront Vienna and the opportunities? And I will ask you each for your one sentence of advice in a second. Uh, I was speaking with everyone beforehand, and here's a few super cities. A bunch of us have been here. And I'd like to know, since everyone here seems to be from Vienna, in the last five years, if you have been to this city, please raise your hand. You ready? First one. In the last, of course, you've been to Vienna. <laughs> Don't raise your hand for Vienna. Everyone's from Vienna. I got it. Next question. Yeah. <laughs> last five years, LA, Los Angeles. Okay, down. It's about half. Shanghai. Maybe 15%? Hands down. Rio de Janeiro. Similar number? Different people, too. Looks like Shanghai and Rio attracts a different crowd. Uh, next one, how about Eindhoven, considered a super modern city? Eindhoven? So close, and yet so far. Mecca. Mecca. They're modernizing that square, so no Mecca. <laughs> <laughs> and how about last one, Mumbai? I think you guys have to get out more. Okay, one sentence for Vienna vision of the future, a recommendation, an agenda. Or if you like, I can start on this side, because we'll yeah, be out of time. Yeah, start on this side. OK. All right, it's up to us to co-create the cities of the future. Technology can help. Lovely. Invest in the best talents and try to bring them together to grow faster than being alone. Talent. Uh, being transparent and sharing as much as possible of uh, uh, new technologies and digital world. So like uh, really opening it up to the crowd and to, to, to the population. Most livable city in the world for citizens and experts. And I guess my answer is, um, if there was a time that I wanted to be born, uh, my answer actually was the future. And it seems to me a dream of the future is something I don't see on the streets in Vienna when I'm, when I'm visiting here. It's before or after the nuclear war? I'd like to be born just before the nuclear war. <laughs> <laughs> or just before you want to take part. So I can see it. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you.